of a fair and a just election. Hear our cry and turn our hearts to you. Nobody knows what the hell is going on. There's never been anything like this. We will not let them silence your voices. We're not going to let it happen. this scene there was the beginning of the movie bad faith i had clips in another video but they were too low so i re-recorded some things so that you guys can see that now let's continue on further so you can hear from the woman that was in trump's administration during the time of all of the chaos where she was in charge i believe of homeland security or something like that so let's continue faith is primary for me faith is the first thing that I build my life around. My reaction to January 6th was my stomach churned. I, I, I wanted, I was nauseous. I wanted to throw up. People had Christian flags. They were praying on bullhorns outside the Capitol while beatings were occurring inside the Capitol. It was a co-opting of my faith that is supposed to be a faith of peace. From a security standpoint, it was also devastating. We spent 20 years preparing for another bad day, building up intel systems, law enforcement capabilities, the protective measures, and that failure was utterly on display. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for allowing the United States of America to be reborn, the economy, the globalists, and the traitors within our government. The galvanizing force behind the assault on the U.S. Capitol was a political movement known as Christian nationalism. The leaders had a long-range plan to seize power and impose their political vision by any means necessary. They knew that the only way to create a theocratic Christian nation was to overthrow our democracy. And that's what they set out to do. And as you can see, she's talking about how she's a woman of her faith and how she was sick to her stomach. And as you see and remember the chaos, somehow many Americans and Christians, the people that call themselves Christians, has totally forgot about the chaos that descended on America in June, I mean, uh, January of 2021, when Mr. Trump refused because he's such a poor sport, he's a liar, he's a now felon and everything else that he refused to concede and turn the election over that he lost. And here's the chaos that pursued. And we're, I'm going to show you some more clips in there because the message of this is Christians, what you going to do? What are you going to do? We talked about on a previous message or two back where why did Christians choose him after knowing that this had happened, that you are so desperate because of your extreme ideas that you want to push on everybody else, that you don't care. You don't care how you get it, how you get your way or whatever. Well, let's take a trip back to memory lane from the movie. To some of you, this is going to be new for you. Some of you, you already know, but Paul Weirich, let's look back at one of the main guys that got this push going of this nationalist movement. Listen to him. You who are pastors, who have been chosen by God Almighty to lead, we are talking about Christianizing America. We are talking about spreading the gospel in a political context. We share the guilt because we have ceded certain areas of endeavor to the devil. Paul Weyrick was a dangerous combination of religious zealot and savvy Republican operative. He realized that if he could organize an army of angry Christians into a powerful voting bloc, he could completely transform America. Make no mistake about it, even if we should prevail in every possibility, in the November election, our job will just be beginning. And as you can hear him talking about Christianizing America, 
talking about making sure basically that they are involved in the political realm in any and every kind of way. And we're going to look at another clip or two as we see how he infiltrated and linked up with Pat Robertson, how they linked up with Pat Robertson and and and, and others and everything to try to get the uh, 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 Jerry Falwell Sr. and work in tandem and, and so that they can get the names of everybody and do everything so that they can get behind the evangelicals can get behind the political movement so that you can get what you want. You support our candidate, we'll get you what you want. And basically, it's just being used. And that's where we are today. Trump is doing nothing but using evangelicals just like the same way that it was planned from the whole, from the beginning, from that, from the set foundation. So let's look at this so you can see what I'm talking about. Paul Weirich went to Jerry Falwell who was just a fundamentalist preacher, and Pat Robertson, who had a TV show, and said, give us your lists. Give us your names, and we'll make you household words in America. And they created the moral majority. It was a political creation from the political right to co-opt evangelicals into a Republican power block in their party in the country. And that's what they did. And as you can see there, that's the foundation of it. This is where it got to going and things. They weren't even on a platform back then of the abortion. Abortion wasn't even talked about for like Jerry Farwell, as you're going to see right here, until five years later. They weren't even talking that. The church was basically pro-choice. Take a look. The elect who is committed to help us pass a human life amendment through the Congress, we all agree that life begins at conception. And we're willing to stand up together in the defense of voiceless, defenseless, unborn babies. One of the most durable myths is that the religious right galvanized as a political movement in direct response to the Roe v. Wade decision of January 22nd, 1973. And it is utterly false. Jerry Falwell, by his own admission, did not preach his first anti-abortion sermon until February of 1978. That's more than five years after the Roe v. Wade decision. The religious right responded to a court ruling, but it was not the Roe v. Wade decision. It was a lower court ruling on school desegregation. June 30th, 1971, the court ruled that any institution that engages in racial discrimination or racial segregation is not by definition a charitable institution. Therefore, it has no claims on tax-exempt status. It got the attention of people like Jerry Falwell, who had his own segregation academy in Lynchburg, Virginia, and in particular, Bob Jones University, which had a long history of racial discrimination. And that provided the catalyst for the religious right. It had nothing to do with abortion. Weirich's clever move was to recognize that if he really wanted grassroots evangelicals to be part of this movement, he needed an issue other than defense of racial segregation in the late 1970s. And as you can see there, because they lost, they, they wanted to continue on with their little segregation uh, at Bob Jones University and everywhere else, and they knew that they were going to lose their tax status. Well, we got to figure out something else to somehow to get this thing going. So they rallied behind the abortion issue and figured they can get evangelicals fired up about that. So now we have a society. They're still utilizing that. Now they're utilizing trying to say that the Christianity is being under this great attack, which is a big lie. You know, you think that people are being dragged out of their houses and being beheaded for standing on Jesus, which is a lie. Then some people say, well, you wait a minute. You saw that at the Olympics, this, that or that or that. You know, I, uh, somebody wrote me in this. I was, I don't even watch the Olympics to begin all the, I, I like to watch track and field and the gymnastics and a few other things. I'll get to it when I get to it. It's France. We know that we, we, we won't even go there with them. They got some things going on. Every part of the world's got their holy little issues, but it's the world. What do you expect? It's the world. The world is lost. And that's why it's our job as Christians is to conduct ourselves in such a way where we make a difference to the world and hopefully do some transforming by planting seeds and preaching the gospel. We don't do it by 
compromising our morals, compromising our integrity, compr all of that and say, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead. I know Mr. Trump, he tried to overthrow the government and I know that, you know, I, I, you know but I, I'm just going to believe everybody else. I'm going to believe what Mike Glendale says, the pillow talk. Look up Rhino and the picture pops up and Google it, Google it. Sure, you know, Google it. I mean, I mean there she is, you know. But if you look, you know, you look at criminal rhino, and there's Brad. Now, and they, I, outside, I called Liz Cheney a criminal, and went, and they said, well, what do you mean by that? That was on all the fake news here. Okay, hold on. Go ahead, take that call if you got to take I'm it. I'm live on TV. I got to go. That's what happens when you're with okay. Mike Lindell. It's probably the uh, president calling so, you. So, yeah, yeah. I'm going to believe them when they say, oh, we've got this evidence, and that we saw ballots being dumped. Or you hear this. Wacky lady, as we talked about, Kat Kerr, where listen to what she says happened with the ballots. Take a look. Not just you, but hundreds of thousands of ballots for the 2020 election, all voting for Trump, of course. They are uncovering all of them. They have so much evidence right now. And as I have said before in the past, and will always say, it is going to be proven that he won. They've stolen the elections. They've thrown them in the river, the ballots in the river. They've burned ballots. They've hidden ballots. Even shot down a Black Hawk helicopter. Isn't this strange? Bringing them from the bringing them from the, um, the the military that was overseas. They were carrying the ballots, and that helicopter was shot down, so that they could never be counted. And then a lot of they they even now finding them in lockers and finding them in chests. They're finding them in all kinds of different places, buried. They're still finding ballots, like uncovering hundreds of thousands, not just you, but hundreds of thousands of ballots for the 2020 election, all voting for Trump, of course. They are uncovering all of them. They have so much evidence right now. And as I have said before in the past, and will always say, it is going to be proven that he won. See, and this is the wild nonsense that has infiltrated the lie. And the father of lies is who? That's a quiz for some of you. Some of you may not know that are new to the faith or whatever, but many of you know. The Bible says the father of lies is Satan. And this is why you see all of this total chaos within the church, because Satan is behind it. And he has raised up false ministries to push a false message and a perverted version of Christianity. And this is why you see this. These people that are calling themselves prophets, these people that are calling themselves pastors and teachers and that. But yet they get in there behind a pulpit, they get behind a camera and they start talking political nonsense, elevating political figures, lying about election stuff, lying about- When the 2020 election hit, I had already had prophesied in August, documented prophecy that the election, that they would try to steal it through a planned chaotic thing. You've seen me show that prophecy hundreds of times. We watched an election be stolen with somewhere around 80 million people who voted for Donald Trump. And people they don't agree with and demonizing other folks, Democrats, gay people, anything else, and doing all of that. And they're doing nothing but standing there as an ambassador and a messenger for Satan. And, and instead of having some common sense, instead of being able to see that Mr. Trump is a bold-faced liar that has been lying his entire life. The guy has lied and lied and lied, and for some reason or another, people don't think that he can do any wrong. I mean, I've never seen somebody's more perfect in my life. I mean, when the man, when they asked him, all of a sudden, you know, if you saw in this clip where he, let's look at, let's look at this clip where he, he slipped up and said he's not a Christian. They're trying to say he's a Christian, but let's look at that. Let's, let's see what he said. You won't have to do it anymore. Four more years. You know what? It'll be fixed. It'll be fine. You won't have to vote anymore, my beautiful Christians. I love you, Christians. I'm a Christian. I love you. Get out. You got to get out and vote. In four years, you don't have to vote again. We'll have it fixed so good you're not. You see that? He's begging for votes at this turning point in USA and said, I'm not a Christian. Somebody, they tried to say, well, he said he's a Christian. It's not like he said, I'm not a Christian to me. I don't know. What do you think he said? But he's at turning point. Charlie Kirk, if you look at the movie Bad Faith and they're going to show you, I don't know, I'm going to keep showing you a bunch of clips and extend this video super long. Um, 
And, and uh, as I'm talking, if I go back as I get ready to edit the video and I think I can squeeze it in there so that you can see without making it too long, I'll put it in there. If not, you need to check the movie out. It's only, I think it's only 99 cents on Amazon. They are trying to make sure people see this. 99 cents. It'll be the best 99 cents you ever spent. Council National Policy has a series of very deep ties to adjacent organizations. Glue from 2015 through was developing something that became known as the Glue Insights micro-targeting platform. And things like that. But the turning point, all of these organizations, all links back to this Paul Wyrick. All of this, this is links back to this moral majority, all of the things that they want to do to try to Christianize America and things. And look at some of the speakers that have been at this turning point. Look at these faces. Look at them. Marjorie Taylor Greene. You know how wild and this lady shouldn't even be in con shouldn't even be up there in the Congress. Up there. She has no business up there in the White House. That lady is just total chaos. Look at this. Steve Bannon is in prison right now. Look at that. Look at some of these faces. These are the speakers. Kimberly Guilfoyle News. I mean, look, are you serious? Look at that. These are the people that are involved with this type of thing. And guess what? They're all election deniers. They're all like, and they call themselves Christians. All of the people, they're clapping. They're clapping when Trump said this about Kamala Harris. Listen to this when he called her a bum. Listen to this. Of defining Kamala Harris in this race. She was a bum three weeks ago. She was. And Christians supposed to be in the crowd and you're clapping to that. I don't care. You know, you know. As a Christian, there's some things that just shouldn't come out your mouth. And as I said, there's evidence of no fruit in Mr. Trump's life and things like that. Now, John McCain, which is somebody I truly respected, that I didn't agree with everything, but one thing I knew, he was an independent and he was a maverick, as they said. And they and the way that Trump did him, and he didn't profess to be some Christian or whatever. I don't know what his faith was. But one thing he did have was some sense of integrity and something. And he stood up there when that woman tried to say Obama was a Muslim or something like that. And he took the mic from her and said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. You know, he's just a guy that a great, uh, has a family man or whatever I have disagreements with. You will never see something like that from Trump. And he wants to continue to play the Christian community and evangelicals go along with it. You need to look yourself in the mirror. I'm dead serious. I mean, it's pitiful. Are you that desperate? Are you that desperate to try to incorporate your views into the society because you don't like the way things are going? Are you that desperate? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. But you know, as I close, you know, as I close, I don't want the video to be too long, but I was thinking, let's look at part of, because uh, 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 it's in there too. We talked about Robert Jeffress and uh, Franklin Graham and Tony Perkins, those that have given Trump the platform and has, uh, you know, uh, endorsed him and things like that. Listen to Robert Jeffers right here, because this is from the movie too. Correct to say, the truth is this, America was founded as a Christian nation and our success as a nation depends upon our fidelity to God's word. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk. It's not in the Constitution. It was in a stinking letter, and it means nothing like what they say it does. When the founders configured this new nation, they recognized that religious establishment was a form of tyranny. Uh, it tyrannized the people. And so they came up with this radical idea that the people themselves should determine how they wanted to worship rather than have that dictated by the state. The separation of the state from the church is a key Baptist confessional principle that predates the United States of America. Because people have to come to God one by one through new birth, Someone cannot be claimed as a Christian because of citizenship in a state. So if the state or the culture bullies people out of openly expressing their religious views, you don't end up with Christians. You end up with pretend Christians. And um, as an evangelical Christian, I don't think that takes anyone to heaven. 
And you see that? That's coming from a man that's behind a pulpit on a Sunday morning when his congregation flat out telling them a lie, that America was founded as a Christian nation. That is a lie. And, we, and I want you to look, look at this picture right here. This is an article. And then uh, I'm going to show you the article. See that article there? And then that's the family picture of my great, great grandfather, uh, my, my great grandfather, my great, great aunts, uh, um, things like that. Old pictures of family members. Now, my great grandfather was born in uh, 1882 and died in 1976. And from that article, I want to read you something real quick. I, I couldn't print out the things. I had to write some of it down. The printer wasn't working right. But he was uh, one, uh, the first black barber in my city here in Ohio, as a fact. It says, during the day, because he was being interviewed, because he was 93 at this time, and being interviewed by the newspaper. And he said, in the evenings, he cut hair for a quarter and shaves for a dime. And during the daytime, he worked in the steel plants alongside men from Germany, Romania, Greece, and Poland. And they were un they, they needed unskilled immigrants to load and unload steel cars at, because things were booming in the car industry. Many had to return to their country after two years, it says. And uh, my great-grandfather, was a, his, his mother was a slave born to a housemaid and an Indian chief. The United States rounded up many Indians and tried to make them into soldiers for the Mexican-American War. Most refused and were killed trying to escape. My great-grandfather's maternal grandfather was captured and enslaved. There's a whole lot more in there, but that's, that's uh, here the history of that. And here, what my great-grandfather and the things that he had seen and went through and and, and working along the side with immigrants and making a difference in America. And then at the same time, having to deal with this, all of the slavery and the Indians and all what went on. And for somebody to stand behind a pulpit, for some preachers and that continue to do this nonsense, for some Christians to continue to say this, that America was founded as a Christian nation, you need to go back to school. I don't know what, you need to do something but you need to go back and get re-educated. You tell me, after hearing about that, my great-grandfather, what they went through, and people, many others in this nation, what was going on during that time that this was a Christian nation. The Ku Klux Klan called themselves Christian. You know, so many slave owners called themselves Christians. And then, so you tell me what was so Christian and so going on, and no, we know what happened with the Indians, everything that was a total chaos, as you see some of these pictures here that, that, that went on, even though we got out of slavery and you go into the Civil Rights era and, and, and uh, the Jim Crow era and all of that. So Christian, huh? Yeah, you had pockets of people that, you know, you always going to have pockets of people of faith and this or that. But America has a lot of sins still deep stained within. And unfortunately, I'm going to say it, Mr. Trump brings out the worst in a whole lot of these people. He brings out that hiddenness that's with inside some of these people. That's what it is, because back then when Powell Wywick and uh, 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 Jerry Farwell seniors and, 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 uh, uh, and the others back there, Pat Robinson, all of them back in them days and Bob Jones and all of them. They didn't want to be bothered with, they wanted to have a, their own version of America. Their version of America is totally different than what most of me and you see in today's time. And unfortunately, the people that are in the forefront, the Charlie Kirks and, and these other reawakening things, the tours that goes on with these so-called prophets of, uh, that, that are out here, all of these events that promote Mr. Trump and promote a Christian nationalism and all of that, they want to go back. They want to go back. When they say, make it great again, yeah, they want to go back in time and take a time war back into time into where they think that that was okay in society. Well, you know what? It's not okay. It's not okay for a Christian to conduct themselves the way that many of these people conduct themselves, spreading hate behind pulpits, 
lashing out against people, calling them names, and you say that you are of the faith, sitting there pushing people away and preaching a false Jesus, all of that, that's not okay. And on this channel, we're going to continue to say what's not okay. Give God the glory. Take the devil head on, punch him right in between the chops. Evangelism for God is the channel. My name is Maurice Braxton. Until the next video, my friends, take care. God bless.